I want to talk about making space for dreams and goals. And I'm going to talk about that um, in a personal way for me, which is through repentance. And because I have felt my soul open up through repentance, and I feel like there's, there's more room. There's more room for those goals and dreams. So I'm going to share that two different times in my life where I've experienced that. So I am native to Utah. I grew up in a small town. I'm the oldest of seven children and was raised in a LDS home, but we did not read scriptures and pray together. We were pretty, I mean, I know homes come in all different ways, but my parents are very creative. So structure wasn't our thing. And at an early age, I started struggling. I struggled from 13 on. I just said, I am not going to church. And in our home, you kind of did what you wanted to do. So that was that. And if I had one thing that I could look back on my life and say, it was like, I did not know who I was. You know, I didn't know who I was to our Heavenly Father. And I, I really struggled with relationships. I thought that what boys thought of me was the most important thing. And, you know, that's something that I, when I look at my mom, if I could give her, it would be for her to know how amazing she is. Because I feel like as a woman and as a mother, that is, we can't give something to our children that we don't personally know. And so I've come to, to see how important it is for me to keep that direct connection. More important than anything else, as much as I love my husband and my children, number one for me is between me and my Heavenly Father. And by the time I was 17, not going to church, I was pregnant with my first child. And, and I remember feeling, um, I guess you could say pretty hopeless. I moved out, lived in a low income apartment at that point in time and still didn't think that it was about me and God. I just thought I needed to find the right person to get married and settle down. And, and so that led me into another relationship. I ended up pregnant again, married and, and, about that time, my parents moved to Salt Lake. My marriage wasn't going well. And again, we decided to divorce and I moved up with my parents. And so I have two children. I'm a single mom. I remember being pretty sad and my dad telling me, you should try to read the Book of Mormon. And I said, well, I just don't even think that's true. And he said, you know, you're smarter than that. You've never read it. Why don't you try reading it? <laughs> so, and my dad challenging me, you know, and I... I started to read the Book of Mormon and I felt this comfort and peace. I wasn't going to church. I was working at the time as a photographer, but I started to see that there was a little bit more. And I remember going um, to the church after my little girl was born and my dad blessed her. And I was sitting in the, the room where other mothers were nursing their children. And I thought, how do I get from where I am? To where they are like I, again i just thought that i needed to find the right relationship again not knowing again that it was about me and my heavenly father and i got in another relationship and for me i know that infertility is a problem for some but for me i get pregnant that's just what happens <laughs> like so i have six children and, and it just happens for me so i got pregnant again and and i remember being scared because i thought i'm not taking care of the children i have i'm not you know, I didn't have any child support or relationship with their fathers. And so I got on my knees and I prayed. And I said, the first real prayer I had ever said, which was, Heavenly Father, I don't know what to do. I'm scared. Please help me. And I felt this comfort and warmth come over me. And I knew that I was having this child was special. And I knew that Heavenly Father wanted me to find his family and that I would be giving him up for adoption. And I, and I remember talking to my, my parents and my dad said, you're strong. I, I know you can do this. And my mom said, it would be too hard. I don't think you can do this. And, but I had been given that, that answer in prayer. And so I started down that journey and, and it was beautiful. I met an amazing family and we, we connected. They weren't just there for my son. They were there for me. And as soon as I had him, I felt completely empty inside. I didn't get any counseling. I didn't really know anything about trauma or how to deal with my feelings. I just thought, well, I'll just keep powering through. And I ended up addicted to prescription drugs. And so I'm about 25, 26 years old, and my life has gone pretty rough. So I'm not dreaming about anything. I am just thinking, I'm not setting goals. I'm just trying to survive at that point. I had an experience where I came home late one night and my son, my oldest son, my mom was taking care of my kids. I had lost my job, so I was pretty low. And my mom said, I don't know what would ever want, what would 
bring you to change your life? Like, what is it, Portia? What could it possibly be? And because this little boy loves you, these kids love you. And if this isn't enough for you, whatever would be. And I walked downstairs that night and I sat on my knees and I begged God. I said, I will give up everything. I won't ever date another man. <laughs> I'll give up anything you want me to. I can't do this on my own. I need help. And so the next day I walked across the street to our bishop, my parents' bishop. I didn't know him. I hadn't been to church. And I said, I knocked on his door and I said, please help me. I need help. <laughs> and, and he said, oh, I'm going to help you, but I need to get some other people involved. <laughs> so he had somebody come and take me to a 12 step meeting. And he worked with me and helped me through that repentance process. And I remember him saying, Portia, you might be the most selfish person I've ever met, <laughs> which seems so horrible. Nowadays, a bishop would be kicked out for doing that. But honestly, I'm so grateful that he was able to help me and he spoke truth to me. And he told me that if he promised me, he said, I promise you with priesthood, power and authority, if you go to church, if you read your scriptures and you say your prayers, your whole life will change. And I needed a whole life change. I was desperate. And so we started down the repentance process together. I remember calling him at work and I said, I figured it out. I know why I did all the things I did. And he said, why? And I said, because I wanted to. And he said, oh, Portia, that's beautiful. Because I had been blaming my mom and my circumstances and my ex-husband, and it was everyone else's fault but my own. But as soon as I took ownership, I had power in my life. And I continued on that journey, and I felt uncomfortable because it is hard to come back to church when you haven't been there. I just didn't feel comfortable. But people were kind to me, and I was determined. And I remember being six months down this path and taking my son on a field trip and going, wow, I'm being a good mom. <laughs> it was just like epic for me because, you know, and, and that's the beauty of repentance, those beautiful little treasures that come. And so, you know, what happens when you, when you start down that journey is that it's hard and it becomes amazing because that's what repentance is. And I met my husband, which I wasn't looking for him at all. And, and we got married and we went to the temple and my husband adopted or my two children. And, and I was grateful every day for what God had given me. And, and it grew, you know, I had a desire to start my own photography company. It just went boom, boom, boom. I went from 20, 30 weddings a year to 200 weddings a year with employees. And, and I forgot those basic things that the bishop had promised me. I wasn't reading my scriptures daily. I was going way too fast. And after our, and two kids close together again, because that, that's something that just happens for me. So we had Jackson and Sadie. And after I had Sadie, I had a back surgery and I relapsed. And, and I didn't get honest with me myself, you know, and I ended up getting involved in these illegal real estate deals, which took me to prison. And I remember walking into a courtroom and feeling just as, as low. I mean, it was the most, the most sorrowful place I've ever been because the, the reality of, of the choices that I had made and what I had done was so real for me that day. And I looked back at my husband and my children and I said a prayer and I asked for strength. And then I stood up and I apologized and the judge sentenced me. And I knew that day that I would be going to prison for a long time. I would, I ended up being gone for four and a half years and my little, my youngest daughter was seven years old at that point in time. And the only thing that I knew was that I was going to get through it. That's it. I didn't know how, because there was a strength above my own that was holding me that day. And so I did, I said goodbye to my husband and my children. And I walked into a, a prison in Dublin, California and just completely devastating. And after three days of not wanting to leave the cell and, being so lost and so broken, I got on my knees and I said the most important prayer I've ever said in my entire life, which was Heavenly Father, I feel like nobody to anybody. I am in the deepest hole. I have failed my family, my community. I have failed you. Nobody knows my name. I'm not a mother. I'm not a wife. Nobody cares for me here. I need to know who I am to you. And I felt this incredible amount of love. I felt so much love coming to that room, kneeling by myself, a nobody. God knew me and he loved me in a way I had never experienced. So much love that I thought I never needed a man. <laughs> I mean, I love my husband, but clearly 
who we are to our Heavenly Father is, oh, and not just me, but that's, that's how he feels about everybody else. I could see that we all had this important purpose on this earth and the value is in, impossible to describe. And because of that experience, I knew that I was going to get through four and a half years of prison. Now, I, I didn't know how hard it would be. It's impossible to know that. I mean, I took it step at a time and there were times that I thought, I can't do this. It's going to break me. And I, I had to get back on my knees over and over again in prayer, hours and hours I spent in prayer. And I had a lot of repenting to do. One of the good choices that I made was I went to my bishop and my state president and they helped me get through that. So that when I went to prison, I had support. I had the support of my community, our ward, and I was even able to take my garments, which was a huge blessing. I mean, I, I, told, I, mean, I was so grateful for that. So I started the repentance process and I can testify that when we do our part, the gospel, our Heavenly Father, and the leaders in the church are right there with you. And it's powerful to have that support. So I continued to walk through each hard thing like Gina Lynn shared. You know, I wasn't grateful for the hard at the time. There were times that I thought I just need to get out early and I would do everything I could to try to get home. A couple of things happened. One was when I made the choice to do everything I could in the circumstances that I was in to be a good mother, to be a good person, to focus on what the Lord wanted me to do right there, right then. It changed things. It really opened things up for me. I started to focus on who I could be, the kind of servant that I could be, what my stewardship was in the situation that I was in. So that was an eye opener for me. But even bigger for me was this. I was in a therapy class with about 70 women and a woman walked in and she, she read a list of everything she'd ever done to hurt anyone. And it was categorized and it was things that I had, that would be really hard to say out loud. And she was so brave. Like you could literally feel the power in the room when she did that. And afterward, the therapist asked her, she said, I just have one question. I just want to know what would make you care so much about your future that you would stand here today today and be so completely honest. And she looked at her and she said, because I've tried everything else to change my life except being honest. And today I'm going to be honest and it's going to work or I'm going to die. I can't do it anymore. And, And when I heard that, I knew that there was power in me owning my life in complete ownership. And so I made a list and I had the time to do it. And it was extensive. It was like a, probably it was a spreadsheet and it took me almost six months to write out my life and how I had hurt others and, and be able to look at it from a different view. I actually started having compassion for myself as a young girl. And when I made that list and I shared it with some girls in the rec yard, I asked them to come down with me and I shared it. And then I buried it. And I, t- I mean, and this, this was stuff that I didn't necessarily need to share with the bishop. It was just everything that I had gone through so that I could be reflective of, of where I was and what I wanted to change. And when I did that, my soul opened up. I started dreaming again about my future. I made a list of things that I wanted to change in myself. One of them was I wanted to become a good listener and a good friend. I made my goal list. I wrote a mission statement. And so for me, what preceded those goals and dreams and the visualizations of what I wanted my life to be was to open my soul through repentance. And that changed it for me. I started having hope and looking forward to something new again. My last, the last part of my sentence was so beautiful because I was able to connect wholeheartedly with people whose lives were so much more difficult than mine. The connection I felt to our heavenly father was so pure and real. I was almost like, Concern. I was concerned. I was nervous to come home because I found something so beautiful. I enjoyed the connection because there was no social media and I would just sit in the sun and feel so much joy. And so when I came home, because that day came where my husband was sitting outside with the bouquet of flowers, which was so cool. And I got in the car and I was completely overwhelmed. What I knew was that everything important was inside of me, that there was no worldly accomplishment money, things, what other people think of me was not going to rule my life anymore. That who I was to our Heavenly Father was what I was on this earth to know and to see that in others as well. And so I just I just want to testify that that has been such a beautiful piece of my life, that I have found freedom and the space to rewrite my life through repentance. I know that that, that comes through the atonement of Jesus Christ. 
and know that no matter where you are on that path, when you turn to him, it changes everything. And the, the life that I have today is so beautiful. I could not have imagined a life this beautiful when I was standing in that courtroom. I could not have imagined when I was a single mom in a low income apartment, what Heavenly Father had him planned for me. And none of us can imagine the beauty of the life that he has in store for us. So I'm grateful for this opportunity to just share a little bit about my life and how those goals and things have come into fruition. It's come through repentance and ownership. It's come through opening my soul to our Heavenly Father and His plan for me. And I just want to share that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.